My Gavan and Melonine, and well met indeed. I'm Eric here, Galadirithan, and welcome back to Divide and Conquer as we bring you another developer diary on to number 36, I believe. Could be wrong with the number, but I think it's 36. If you've never seen one of these, <clears throat> I'm going to go through some of the changes to Divide and Conquer over the past however long it's been since the last one. The first half will deal with the campaign map and changes to the campaign play, and then the second half, or I don't think it's 50-50, but the second bit will be about the battle map. There's links in the description that will jump you to the battle map point if you're only interested in that, um, or you can start here with the campaign. Uh, now, without any further ado, let's dive straight in. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Reunited Kingdom, which many of you, of course, are interested in learning about. The Reunited Kingdom is only available to the Dunedain. You cannot use it if you play as Gondor. So remember that first of all. Gondor do not get the Reunited Kingdom. In order to form the Reunited Kingdom, Minas Tirith must be in the hands of a good faction. Um, it's been described as not in the hands of an evil faction, so I, I don't think it matters who. So it can be you, Dol Amroth, Gondor, they're the most likely candidates. Minas Tirith must be held by one of those three. You need to be allied as the Dúnedain to Gondor and Dol Amroth. You need to have completed Aragorn's quest, including getting all the way up to the point you get the Oathbreakers. And then you have to send Aragorn off to Minas Tirith for four turns. So he has to stay there for four turns. So you can't sneak in while Mordor are besieging it or something and try and get it. I mean, you might be able to, but uh, he needs to stay there for four turns. At that point, the reuniting will happen. Gondor and Dol Amroth will both be annexed by the Dúnedain. They will form your nation. Your banner, which is this icon down here, will suddenly then change to the reunited kingdom icon. Aragorn will likely at that point then change his campaign strategy model and get a more kingly model rather than the ranger one that he currently has. And you will gain a lot of access to almost all of Gondor's roster. You'll get a few of Dol Amroth's roster as well, but they will mostly be locked to Belfalas, so they'll be, become AOR units. But Gondor's units will form part of your army. Uh, so your, your main focus will be that you're taking on Gondor's burdens, but you also get all of their forces as well. And of course, Gondor's army is far more mainstream than the the rangers of the Dúnedain. The, the rangers always have caveats. They're good at this, but then they're bad at that. Or they're very, very good at this, but then they take forever to train. Like All those kinds of things. Gondor's a bit more mainstream. In the future, there will be some additional units for the Reunited Kingdom and some retextures of existing ones, but those aren't really as of this developer diary. But they will be before version 5 releases to you all. You also, if you choose the Reunited Kingdom, get an auxiliary barracks which lets you train a few local units from around the world, but no elves or dwarves. So you don't get the full Beacon of Hope system, which the Dúnedain used to have access to, but instead you get a few auxiliaries to make up for your lack of early tier sort of trash filler units. So you get a few of those from around the world. Now, the other option with the Reunited Kingdom is that you can deny the reuniting aspect and simply reform Arnor. Now, in order to do that, you need to build the House of Kings in Fornost. So do note that you don't need the House of Kings if you're going for the Reunited Kingdom. You only need it for um, Arnor. So you need to build the House of Kings. You need to be allied to Bree and you need to have upgraded a Numenas. So it requires a lot of work on a Numenas and Fornost. Um, at that point, you will then reform Arnor. I think you'll get another uh, icon. I'm, I'm not sure, actually, if Arnor will get a changed icon. I, I think the Arnor change isn't as, uh, as expansive. But the fundamental key feature is that you will annex Bree. So Bree will stop existing as a faction. Their units that you can train will join you. Their generals will join you. And more importantly, their regions will join you. And they will cease to exist. Uh, so that's the system if you go for Arnor. Now you keep the Beacon of Hope system if you stay as Arnor, so you'll still be able to then train a lot of units from people like Dunland, Enidwyth, Rohan as you make your way down to Gondor to save them if, if you choose to do that. But it gives you a peaceful way of annexing Bree without having to attack them, which some people do rely on. Do note that in both cases, or in any case, the local militia and local archers, which were a Dúnedain early tier unit, they've been removed from the game. And I'll cover that in detail a little bit later on when I show you what units have replaced them. So, to run through, the Reunited Kingdom allows you to annex Gondor and Dol Amroth. You get a faction logo and banner change. Um, your generals will upgrade to get new strategy models which is what um, this fella looks like. So this is a strategy model here. So they'll upgrade and they'll all look different. Obviously, I'm Erebor at the moment, but it would be for the Dúnedain, um, including Aragorn, who gets his kingly look. 
Um, anyone that has a custom bodyguard is respawned for that faction, so you don't lose them. So if you take over Gondor and Boromir and Faramir are still alive, they will respawn in your new nation with their custom bodyguards. So you get all the custom bodyguards, which is good. And you will automatically be set at war with the enemies of Gondor. So you have to watch out for that. You really do take on Gondor's burdens. Um, and also, and a little interesting side note, is that Eastern Osgiliath will automatically upgrade if Gondor own it. Because the Northern Dunedain can't upgrade Eastern Osgiliath, they can upgrade Western, but not Eastern. So if Gondor own Eastern Osgiliath when you form the reunited kingdom, it will automatically upgrade. These later points I have discussed before, but I'm mentioning them again because this one's the reunited kingdom is almost completed, so it, this is covering everything. Under the Arnor system, brief rundown again, you annex Bree, you get a faction icon and banner change. Um, uh, the banner change is this, what's hovering above the, um, the town. And your generals will get an upgraded strategy model again. So there you go. So that's the reunited kingdom in a nutshell. I have heard mention that they might implement the um, batch file feature, which m means that when you formed the reunited kingdom, you can save your game, close the entire game down, run a file that is stored in your divide and conquer directory, and then load the game back up again. And then your faction will then be called the reunited kingdom and your color on the map will have changed. I don't know if they're going to do that. Um, I was always staunchly against that because I, I just always thought, try and keep things simple, but I'm not in charge anymore, so they can do what they like. But they might implement that in later um, iterations. So that's the Reunited Kingdom. Let's go on then to the general changes of which there are many. So starting with something that many of you will already have been looking at and maybe haven't even realized it's changed is a new Dwarven UI. So you can see it all being shown here before you. And if I open a, uh, a tab, there you go, you get new borders and things around the edges there. And it's just a lot cleaner, a little darker, but more dwarven overall, isn't it? Um, so that's been incorporated. It comes from a mod called DAC Extended Edition, and they've graciously allowed the DAC team, which doesn't include me anymore, which I feel I need to say because lots of people still think I am part of it. But uh, it comes from DAC Extended Edition. Additionally for Erebor, Onazanar finally can train dragon slayers, which is absolutely fitting because this is where the bloody dragons live and was always an oversight on my part from, from way back when I was a member. So don't blame it on me, but it's been fixed, which is good. Over to Dorwinian. Dorwinian now start with a boat. And there it is, sitting just outside of Karasant. So you can now ship troops back and forth from Nabirka at your leisure, which is always very helpful. Speaking of ports as well, the Ardenayim have finally been given a culture bonus in forts. Um, in ports, sorry, not forts. So as you move around the world or wherever you choose to settle at the start of the game, you will get faster culture on coastal regions, which leads its, lends itself quite nicely to them being the quasi Umbar Raider coastal pirate faction. So they get culture, culture increase from ports, which is good. In addition, Corsair mercenaries, who are scattered around the coasts of the world and available to almost everyone, now have a much slower replenishment and they don't automatically start available. So in, if you started at turn one as Ended Wife, for example, and you wanted to train some Corsair mercs, you could probably get them in these coastal regions. And previously, you'd be able to get them immediately. So you could train a couple of Azrazair, or they're called Corsair now, actually. You could train a couple of Corsair mercs straight away. Now you have to wait for them to replenish, which is probably around eight turns or so. So you can't get them straight away. And outside of Harad and Harondor, they are far, far less um, likely to show up, is a poor way of phrasing it. They replenish slower outside of Harad and Harondor. So you'll get far more curl sairs down here in the south than you ever would anywhere else. Speaking of the south and keeping in this theme, Kand have also now finally been given the option to start the game as a horde. Now, I don't really know the implications of that on the Blue Wizard script because it's not been listed in the changelog, so I don't know how it affects the Blue Wizards. I would assume, as with the discussions we had before I left the team, that the Blue Wizard script has probably been amended accordingly, but I don't know at the moment. So all I can tell you is that if you play as canned in version 5 as of right now, which many of you can't, but when it, if it were released right now, Kand would allow for a horde start. So instead of settling and starting here with Amukand, Oibamari and Kizilgum, you would instead be a horde and you could bugger off. You could start wherever you like. So um, the Ardenayim, Kand and uh, Khazad-dum are now the only horde nations in the game. Although khazad isn't really because you're an, you're an on-rails shooter really, aren't you? But Kand and Ardenayim are now true hordes, so you can go anywhere you want and start wherever you like. Um, I assume more changes will come to that in time, but for the moment that baseline has been put into the mod. 
Moving over to Gundabad, they can now train Azog's Defilers from Moria. Azog's Defilers are their absolutely fantastic um, Warg Rider unit that comes from Moria. So it's adding a Moria unit to Gundabad's roster. But additionally, Gundabad gets much faster replenishment of all of the enslavement units overall. So the enslavement feature of the Gundabad is now far more of a thing. And if you can train any of those units, you'll be able to get them a lot more readily than you could in the past. In addition, the historical battles have been fixed and will now work again in the mod. So the historical battles are played, as many of you know, at the, at the main menu. You can choose to play a custom battle, a campaign, multiplayer, or a historical battle. And all they are is fixed set battles. They take place at a certain location on the campaign map, and they take advantage of unique tiles, such as Amun Hen, for example, which actually has its own battle map, which is barely ever seen because no one ever fights here because it's just in the middle of nowhere. But Amun Hen actually has, although that technically is Amun Hen, it actually has its own battle map. And interestingly, so does the crossing of the Argonath. So there's two unique battle maps here that most people probably don't even know are in the mod because no one ever fights here. And you need to be on the exact tile to make it work, so it's a bit restrictive. So instead, you can go load up a historical battle, you can choose one of those key locations, and the armies will have been assigned for you, and you can just play through. Um, I don't know which ones as of yet have been implemented, but the ones that are there are now fixed, and I imagine they are the ones that are currently already in your game. So if you go into your game, look at historical battles, Although can you, because I think I turned them, I hid them in version 4.6. But anyway, some historical battles are coming to the mod. One off the top of my head, I believe, is the Battle of Five Armies, so I think you get that. I think there's an Azanul Bazaar one as well, which is the battle outside of the steps of Khazad Dum. Um, so there's some of those key battles coming for those of you that like those. Right, there's then some generic map changes, or general map changes, starting with Witherboard over here. Witherboard, as you can see, has claimed a lot of Rakiberg, and there is now a crossing of the river here that allows connection between Torfilin and Witherboard, so there's some trade options available there. Kirith Ungol. Kirith Ungol has been removed as a region and it has been turned into a fort. The model for Kirith Ungol, the campaign strategy model, as you can see when I hover over Minas Morgul, is actually technically part of Minas Morgul, which I think is a really clever way of resolving this issue. So it is uh, I believe it is still the Kirith Ungol battle map, or it may be a generic orc one, uh, it, it doesn't say. Um, but in any event, it is no longer a region. The region that was Kirith Ungol has been moved over here to where we find Dars Gurum, uh, the region of Lithlad, so eastern plains of Nern. Um, that is the new region for Mordor, so a little bit more safety on the eastern side at the expense of one very powerful settlement on the western side. It now makes crossing into Mordor a little easier because you've only got to go through Minas Morgul and then a simple fort blocks the way. And there is the um, strategy model for Kirith Ungol there. Um, the region of Talathang, which was up, according to this, um, in the northeast of the map, but I just cannot remember where it was. So. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, probably very worthwhile going. I think it was around here, but I can't quite recall off the top of my head, I'm afraid. But anyway, there was an extra region up here that has been removed, and it has been added as Upper Fangorn. So there's now two regions of Fangorn, Upper Fangorn and Fangorn Forest. Uh, Rochberg and Fangorn Camp making up those regions. Fangorn Camp is given to Isengard in the Turn 1 auto expansion, so unless you play as Isengard, this will almost always be an Isengard-controlled region. So do look out for that. Um, Byrig's region has been expanded up to the mountains, so Khazad Dum West no longer reaches all the way down to border Byrig, and instead the border ends here. Now, of course, they are still technically a border all the way down, but the actual traversable border ends at the river. Uh, so Byrig now has all of this land on, in part of itself as well. Byrig has also been upgraded to be a larger city size, which is a unique feature of that specific city, but we'll cover that in more detail when I go over all the changes to Dunland in their own developer diary in due course. Uh, Rakiberg, as you saw a little earlier, has been moved slightly southwest, so it's no longer within, um, it may be, depending on the unit type, it's no longer within a day's walk of Dane's Halls or a season's walk. It's a little further afield now. The Mordor settlement of Seragost has been renamed to Kargukor, and the region has become Seragost instead. A little minor name change. But speaking of name changes, something I must confess I am really disappointed to see, but I'm no longer in charge and I can't I can't hold that over them. But Brown Boat has been renamed. Brown Boat is now called Tusture. I don't know if that means Brown Boat in Sindarin or something like that. One can only hope. 
but it is no longer called Brown Boat. And the little in-joke that has lasted in Divide and Conquer for at least eight, or if not nine years now, has been brought to an end. Yeah, and instead it's now called Tustore. So that's, I'm sad to see that they didn't want to carry on the tradition of having a region called Brown Boat. But it is what it is. The Erebor faction now only has one Dwarven Fort, um, which is up here. It no longer has two, so you have a little less opportunity to have free upkeep. Uh, and the fort, I think, has been repositioned. I don't think it was up there before. Um, it's been added, uh, watchtowers have been added along the border of the region as well. So if I just toggle Fog of War, you'll note that straight away Erebor has full map sight. So does Kirigathol. Um, so the, the dwarves now can see all around them at the start of the game, which is a feature which is creeping its way into all of the nations, and I think it's worthwhile. Each starting region would likely have towers all the way around. On the subject of the dwarves as well, for Hamgathol's port has been moved from the eastern coast to the western coast, and it is just there now outside of the city, uh, so it's no longer in this curve, which should probably improve trade, I imagine. Um, a river crossing has been added between Thranduil's Halls and Dale, which was something I noted that I noticed when I was playing um, as Khazadum, actually, when I've been playing as Khazadum. I, th I thought, I'm surprised there wasn't a crossing there, but there's a new crossing just here. An elven fort has been put on the other side of it, as you might expect, so the elves can still defend it quite nicely. Uh, but there's a new crossing there, which facilitates trade between Dale and Thranduil's Halls, because you will note that this river crossing has nothing to do with Thranduil's Halls, so there was a big aspect of trade going uncapitalized um, on. A new generic encampment fort has been added, and I can show you this in um, Mordor. So a lot of... Oh, it's so hard to control the camera. But this new fort campaign strategy model has been added. It is the sort of generic fort that is dusted around the place where there isn't a specific cultural fort required, but a fort would be handy. It uses a vanilla fort battle map, but in orc regions, so like here in Mordor, it will have a custom orcish designed battle map instead but outside of Mordor if you were to bump into that fort off the top of my head I do not know where there is one likely that I could show you uh, but outside of Mordor if you see that cut that generic fort model it will be a generic battle map but inside Mordor it'll have an orcish theme. Kyrandros has been slightly updated as a campaign strategy model and the bridge of Kyrandros has been um, copied to replicate the stone bridge that the game generates when stone roads cross rivers, so that there's some symmetry in Kyrandros there. You'll also note Henneth Anun is now part of the Kyrandros campaign strategy model as well and is no longer its own um, fort slot. So instead, that's just a generic uh, fort on, that you can't see because the strategy model covers it. But I believe it's still Henneth Anun on the battle map. Um, uh, I think. It doesn't say in the listing, and, and I, I haven't tested that, I'm afraid. We've covered Minas Morgul. There's a new elven fort as well, which we were looking at a moment ago, but I could probably show you a better one. Hmm, he says. No, it may well have to be that one. Oh, that one's a bit better. Aren't as many trees in the way. So there's a new elven fort campaign strategy model as well, more reminiscent of the elven towns and castles, and that is what it looks like. You can see there's a little wall there, and then we've got the tree turrets that the elves use, which you may be able to see a little better possibly on this one. At the back there, you can see the trees with the, um, with the uh, what do they call them? Oh, that's going to bug me so much. There's a special name for boardwalks that are up on trees, but I can't remember what they're called. Particularly in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien specifically mentioned these types of boardwalks when the uh, Fellowship crosses into Lothlorien and is, meet, is met by Haldir. He takes them up to these these wooden platforms, and they've got a name, and I can't remember what it is. But anyway, that's by the by. Uh, the Wildman Fort has also been slightly tweaked. There's a Wildman Fort. There we go. There's one just there. So it's got more of a square design, so you can tell that one straight away is a Wildman Fort. It's also got a few of the Wildman strategy models, so it makes it a bit more obvious. The Dwarven Fort has been slightly tweaked as well, so it's got a few less towers now, and it just looks now like an impending fortress plonked on the map, and I like that a lot. I think that looks very, very cool indeed. Uh, a change on the battle map that I'll cover here is siege towers have now been fixed. So this is a applicable to Gondorian, Arnorian, and Elven large cities and strongholds. The siege towers will now always match up to the height of the wall. It's a minor quality of life feature. It didn't stop siege towers working in the past. They, the units just look really stupid. They come off of the siege tower and then they drop about six foot. Whereas now the siege tower will actually be at the height of the wall. So it works as it should, which is much better. 
Um, there's a new battle and campaign AI as well that has been added. It's not been expanded on here, so I don't know how drastic the changes are going to be, but there's going to the campaigns and the battles will feel a little bit different when you play in version 5. They might feel substantially different, uh, but as a bare minimum, they will feel a little different as a new campaign and battle AI has been added. Also, if you're playing as Dunland, and again, I'll go over this more when we cover Dunland properly when I get the green light that they've all been finished, but if you play as Dunland now, Isengard's AI has been set to passive, so Isengard will not do anything if you play as Dunland, which is absolutely perfect and was something we discussed before I left, actually, in with an aim to try and bring Dunland to fight its actual historical enemy of Rohan, rather than always either taking out Enidwyth and then crossing into Bree and dealing up there. Um, instead, now they will be funneled more towards Rohan, and Isengard will take a back seat. Quite literally, they will sit in Isengard and do nothing. Uh, there might be caveats and, and uh, effectors, uh, qualifiers to that, but I don't know them as yet as they've not been added. But I'll talk about that more in a Dunland overview. Alright, so those are the campaign map changes. Now, before we jump into the battle map, there's some new unit cards to show you, so I'll do that at the main menu, and then we'll jump into the battle map. But first of all, let's see what these new unit cards look like. Okay, so to start us off, we are here with Gondor. So the units that have the name Gondor something, like Gondor Spearmen and uh, Gondor Archers, and then there's Gondor Infantry, there we are. They've got new UI there, so you can see very easily straight away what you are looking at. You'll also note some of the fiefdom units have been adjusted, have been updated. Minasithil Guardians, Lossar, Nakaxman, Lebeni Marines, they've all been changed. Lambert and Clansmen. Pretty much, in fact, the entire roster has had new unit cards designed for it, including the Harondor Mercs as well, who are just mercenaries, but they've got new ones. So a lot of new UI cards there. You feel free to pause the video and just take a look through, ask any questions you have afterward. Moving on, we then get Dol Amroth as well. Dol Amroth has been redefined. There's some more and there's some new changes to the unit cards. Seaward Spearman, the one that's standing out to me the most. Um, and it should be a little clearer now as to what exactly the unit has as a weapon, what it does. Uh, so at a glance, you can kind of see what's going on. So those are Dol Amroth. Again, feel free to pause and take a look. Uh, then we come to Rune. The Far Rune mercenaries have had a new um, UI done, and the Balkoth Spearman unit has got a new UI as well. <laughs> Seeming uh, just to make it fit better with the existing Balkoth. Um, well, they're Daratai, aren't they? But it used to be Balkoth. There's the Balkoth tribesmen, there's the Spearman. So they've got new UI as well for the Balkoth units. But perhaps the biggest one, and the one that is drawn most of my attention at the moment, because I've just played as them, is the Ardenaeum have had a complete set of new unit cards as well. Uh, note the Azrazea Warriors, now it's very obvious that they have a two-handed axe, so no longer will I think they're a spear unit in disguise. Household Guard there, and the Royal Guard looking very similar, but they should. You never see the Household Guard. It, it, you, sometimes you do, but it's ridiculously rare, because that, of course, is the General's Bodyguard, and usually always has a General's Portrait. But all of them have been updated and changed, so it's a bit more obvious straight away what you're looking at. You can see the mace of the Nardu Tarik, uh, you can heat the halberdier your fellow is obviously using two hands on his uh, pole arm so you know it's a two-handed weapon the javelin the marines is clearly throwing a javelin which is just all around clearer and it's, it's simpler to see what you're looking at i also think that with the rosadan units it's more obvious that the rosadan are less armored over the ardenaim uh, the armsmen the nardu tarik and the narduzagar for example um it's they they are more evidently heavily armoured, and I think that works in its favour as well. So some UI changes there, mostly all of them coming from uh, the Karen Coma. But lastly, and by no means leastly, we will then jump over to the battle map and take a look at some new units for you all to sink your teeth into. Okay, welcome to the battle map then. So there's four units to show you, or five technically, and we're starting off with the Variags of Kand, who courtesy of the Karen Coma have had a bespoke a brand new nobles model. So this is the bodyguard for Cand, and this is now what they look like. Uh, so a new horse as well with this very cool sort of winged effect on the horse. Um, and then you'll note from the various different colourful designs of the people, there's a lot of purple going on, reds colouring in there, some blues. Um, they just have a very unique design, like nothing we've seen before. And I think that's fantastic. I think they look absolutely excellent. They have a they have that clear inspiration of sort of general eastern peoples from our actual timeline. Um, particularly sort of the Cumans with the masks and then the flags that we all have reminiscent of um, Japan. 
uh, and I just think they look really, really good. Um, of course, they're cavalry archers, and they're very good at that, and now they have an excellent design to go along with it. So I think Cand is getting quite a few changes visually, and it starts with their nobles, which look brilliant. Then we move over to these ones first. These are the Gondor um, Archer and Normal Militia when controlled by the Reunited Kingdom. So they get a new little design to show that they are controlled by the Reunited Kingdom, which is very nice. Remember, you can't change the model of a shared unit, but you can change the textures, and that's what they are reflective of here. So you note the white tree with the crown above it instead of just the standard white tree. And particularly of note is the seven stars above that, the icons of the kingdom of Gondor and Arnor, as it was known. The realms in exile, as they used to be known, and now the reunited kingdom of Gondor and Arnor is the new name. But that was their banner. The white tree, of course, is sacred to Gondor and is indeed sacred to Numenor. And that's why it passed on to Gondor. So it's actually a, an icon of Numenor that's become famous with Gondor. The crown is just the crown of rulership, and then the seven stars, of course, always poignant to the Numenorians. And then we come to two units that have finally been able to be made work in Medieval 2. Here we are, all these years on, and now it's possible. We start off with riderless wags. Uh, now this fellow's had to ride because he's your general, so if this unit ever happened to be a general, it's going to get a goblin on it. But otherwise, riderless wags are in the mod, and there they are standing before you. I don't know, I have paws, actually. You can see them all moving about, if you like. Oh, that's exactly why, isn't it? Because they'll start moving about. Uh, but they are a totally unique model. At the moment, I can only find them available to Moria. So I think they are a Moria-only unit. But riderless wags are in the game, and we'll um, come back and check on them in a second when they're fighting. But the bigger one is Doldor now has spiders. Something long requested. They used to be in the mod before, but finally a fix has been found it was found some time ago actually i think and people started implementing it in various different mods but a fix for beasts is back so sauron and the balrog could go back to being giant elephants if they wanted because the fix is in now uh, but the spiders have been added all right let's speed it up and have a look at what the attack animations look like they're going in for the gondorians which is always nice they are taking a bit of a beating from the nobles though so they're not as they're not um immortal not by any stretch of the imagination here we are, the Wags are start of, sort of starting to sprint. They've got a different sprint and a different walk animation. You keep seeing them sort of galloping. Um, oh, the spiders have come in for the Wags, and it's all going on. Well, the spiders, they're having a jumping attack animation. It looks really good, actually. They don't look out of place at all. They do look a bit shiny, something I've always thought about the spiders, but um, that jumping animation is pretty cool. Uh, and is there a Wag somewhere who's fighting back? My gut instinct is the Wags probably won't have as a vibrant attack animation and they maybe just move their head up and down a bit but at the moment we can't say because the wags i think are fleeing uh, it looks like they are in all directions this is the spiders causing absolute pandemonium pandemonium sorry amongst the gondorians <laughs> that jumping animation is brutal and look how far it knocks them all back blimey absolutely outrageous an excellent addition to Dogledore's roster an absolutely fantastic addition the wag captain did die and the wags indeed are just buggering off as you might imagine they've come up against spiders and they haven't liked it let's just charge our nobles in but that is the end of the developer diary um and those are the changes coming oh very cool isn't that called a coptic or am i thinking of something else no oh, he died <laughs> oh look some of them have s curved swords <laughs> Curved swords. Uh, and some of them seem to have that. I'm sure that's called a Coptic. Is that called a Coptic? Arms people, do let me know. Um, oh, and he's got a straight sword. Oh, that's cool. Such variety. Such variety. Variety is the spice of life, and it's something that Med2 allows. We should absolutely capitalise on it. But anyway, that's the developer diary. Absolutely no word, I'm afraid, at the moment as when version 5 will release. And even if I did know, I wouldn't tell you anyway. But I don't know. So, can't tell you that. When Dunland is finally completed with their overhaul, I will do a specific video just for them. So do watch out for that. If you are interested in seeing the Reunited Kingdom changes in a bit more detail, then I've just started a playthrough of that and you can um, you can find that on the channel. You can watch along with me if you want and watch the disastrous start. <clears throat> but it is from the ashes grow the roses of success and uh, we shall grow them mighty and tall and colourful, I assure you. Um, otherwise, you can join the Divide and Conquer Discord in the description down below. <clears throat> Note that the Divide and Conquer Discord, simply called DAC, and my Discord, called the Order of the Swan, are separate. If you're interested in Divide and Conquer information, join their Discord, not mine. And you can find that in the description down below. But until we speak again, dear friends, Navar Naden Perimad Melonin. 
and farewell.